Good morning and welcome to Duncan Road Church online. We're really glad you can be with us. Uh, this week I was in a car park, uh, just been shopping, and as I returned to my car, I noticed a chap was sitting in his car and one of his tyres was flat. So I knocked on his window and informed him, you got a flat tyre, mate? To which he said, oh, thanks a lot. Um, then I got home and then within a matter of uh, hours, really, a friend came round and he mentioned the fact that he'd had a flat tyre that week. And then on Thursday morning, I noticed my wife's tyre was down, so we had to pump that one up. So I don't know if flat tyres are a bit like buzzes. They all sort of, you don't see one for ages, and then they all come together. Now, if you're wondering why I'm talking about flat tyres, is that I discovered this week that most flat tyres don't happen because of a a blowout, a puncture. It's the air that gradually leaks. In fact, the experts say that uh, they leak gradually, And a car tyre can lose up to two pounds of air in cold weather and even more in warm weather. Two pounds of air. I couldn't lose two pounds on Weight Watchers. Never mind two pounds of air a month from a tyre. Now the problem with slow puncture is, of course, the air goes out slowly. You don't even hear the sss. And by the time you realise you've either ruined the tyre or you're stuck, broken down somewhere. Nehemiah chapter 13, as we conclude this book, I kind of compare it to a flat tire because the air, the spiritual life of the nation seems to have leaked and they've gone back to how they were at the beginning of the book. A little compromise, a little neglect. Reminds me of the old nursery rhyme, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of a horseshoe nail. A little neglect, a little compromise. The air is going out. The spiritual life of the church is draining away. And these folks end up with a flat tire, a flat spiritual life. Well, hopefully it won't end in despair and gloom. There'll be some positive lessons from Nehemiah 13 as we look into it. We went for a walk this week. We saw a lovely lighthouse in the distance and that's why I've chosen this first song. So let's uh, sit back at home. You can join in with my lighthouse. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold Love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea.
Let's uh, link our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Lord, we live in a world of darkness. Uh, We turn our TVs on or we listen to the radio or pick up a newspaper and it all seems doom and gloom. And we see the wickedness of mankind um, in all its uh, wicked glory. But we thank you that you indeed are still the light for this world to those who focus their eyes upon you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a light to illuminate, a light to guide us. And we thank you for this, a light that brings hope in a world of darkness. Thank you that you are our salvation. Whom shall I fear? Lord, thank you that we can say with confidence that we belong to you. And whatever life throws at us, we cannot be separated from you. And not even death itself can separate us from you. Help us, Lord, not to be afraid, but to find you as our stronghold and to trust you. Lord, we thank you that we can come together and we can meet together. And we can, uh, uh, even by technology, uh, still collectively worship you and learn from you and hear from you and bring our praise to you. Lord, we want to thank you that we can dwell in the house of the Lord. Thank you that uh, over the next few weeks that will be practically possible again as your people meet together. And uh, we pray, Lord, that this will continue for for many, many weeks. But we thank you for the opportunity we have today to link uh, electronically. And we pray, Lord, that as a result of meeting together, we might sense your presence and we might hear your voice speak into our hearts, into our lives, into our situations. We pray, Lord, teach me your way. Lead me in a straight path. And we pray, Lord, as we open up your word, feed our souls and encourage our hearts, we ask. We want to, Lord, be strong. We want to be able to take heart for the week ahead. So help us, Lord, to draw close to you. And we want to return our praise to you. For you are the light of the world, the light of our lives. You are the salvation, the hope of this world, our salvation and our hope. So Lord, receive the prayers of your people, the praise and the worship as we commit our time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've got to the end of Nehemiah. We've just got chapter 13 to go. Um, And uh, as it's the last one, we're going to read the whole of the chapter. It's a brilliant chapter. And uh, Nehemiah shares with us uh, this final piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So if you have a Bible, Nehemiah 13, although the words will be on the screen. Nehemiah chapter 13. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple article, and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased, and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God, with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah, 
brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things, so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign, and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times, and for the first fruits. Remember me with favour, my God. Okay, parents at home, grab your little ones, park them in front of the TV because I'm disappearing and Penny's coming up to take my place. Don't forget, if you're able to make it next Sunday to the building, then Explorers will be on for the little ones. So it'll be all uh, safely uh, organized and it'll be great to have Explorers live in the building again as well as people in the congregation. So come along next week as David Bagnish leads the service and uh, Penny and co to explorers upstairs. So hopefully you've got your little ones gathered by the TV and I'm going to hand over to Penny. Good morning everybody. Welcome to the Kids Spot at Duncan Road Church. Now we've got a lot to fit in. So I hope, can you take a deep breath? <sighs> Are you ready? Okay. Well, this is the very last part 
of Nehemiah, the very last chapter. And three times in this last chapter, he says, remember me. He's talking to God, but I was wondering how much you can remember about Nehemiah. And we're going to do a whiz through, and I'm going to see how much you can remember. Are you ready? Ready? Are you sure? Okay. First one. Why was there an autumn leaf as part of our story? Because it was autumn when Hannah and I came and told uh, Nehemiah all about how awful it was in Jerusalem. Then we had a picture of a, a goblet on a tray. Can you remember what that was about? Have a quick think. That's right. That was when Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, which gave him the opportunity to talk to him about going back to Jerusalem. And the king was fantastic. And he gave him loads of stuff and he helped him to uh, get, collect all the resources together and get safely through to Jerusalem so that Nehemiah could see what was going on. And then he didn't tell anyone why he was there. Can you remember? And he went, he went, and he spied. Can you remember what he spied? Yeah, that's not a very good mask, is it? He spied out the walls in the middle of the night just to see how much needed to be done. Whew, it was a lot, a lot needed to be done. And then, and then he encouraged everybody, got them all organized and started the building. Oh, lots and lots of bricks, one on top of the other, and lots of people all doing different things. Got them very organized, and it was hard work. Next part of the story. Can you remember what this was about? A trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Can you remember what that was about? Have a think. That's it. They were building the wall, but at the same time, they had to watch out for their enemies. And, and the Bible says in this part of Nehemiah that they had a, a trowel or, or a spade in one hand and a sword in the other because they had to be ready to build the wall or ready to defend the wall. Cool, that must have been a very tricky time, wasn't it? Wow. Okay. The wall has been built. Hurrah! And then we have the amazing part of the story where Ezra opens up the Bible. And do you remember, every time I opened the Bible, you stood up. Should we try it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you sitting down? Did you stand up? Sit down. Stand up. Sit down. <laughs> well done. Fantastic. And the people heard what God had to say to them. And they were so sad because they realized what a mess they made. Oh, and then they were really happy too because they were told it was time for a celebration. And they had to... Oh! shelters. I haven't got time to build a shelter with sticks, so I bought my pop-up tent. They built shelters, and they all stayed inside their tents, their shelters that they built, for a whole week and had a big party. And they shared the food around, and they had a massive celebration. I think I would have really enjoyed that. I think I might have taken my tent, though, rather than build it out of sticks. But that was a great part of the story, wasn't it? And the people were all excited. And they realized that they needed to promise God. Do you remember this bit? They all signed the great big scroll and all agreed that they'd made lots of mistakes, that God had been very faithful and they remembered all the things, all the things that God had done for them. And they said, we're going to change. We're going to be different. We're going to repent. We're going to turn around, go the other way, go God's way. Yes. And then, ooh, did they have a celebration next? Yes. Then, do you remember last week we made lots and lots of noise? 
Yeah, because all of that was sorted out. The, the wall was finished, and they made loads and loads of noise. So much that the sound could be heard. But miles and miles away, the sound of rejoicing, joy, happiness that God had been so good to them. Nearly there. Oh. And then they chose some people to go and live in Jerusalem. Do you remember who came out of our pot? It was the Gunter family. <laughs> they were the ones moving to Jerusalem. Congratulations, Gunters. And now we're at the end of the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah actually goes back to Babylon for a while. Maybe he, he had that goblet, the, the uh, cup, and he was a cupbearer for a little while. We don't really know. But when he goes back to Jerusalem after a while, oh, oh, he is so sad because you know that special promise the people had made? Yeah, on the big scroll? Well, it was all ripped up and the people had given up. They weren't keeping their promise. They weren't remembering the things that they said they would do. And they'd gone back to their own towns. And Nehemiah was very sad. And I think God must have been very, very sad too. And at the end of the story, Nehemiah does his best to get things in order put things back in the right place and give them some rules to help them remember. But do you know what? Their hearts weren't in the right place. In their hearts, the people didn't really want to serve God. And that's the sad ending to Nehemiah. wonder what you're going to remember most about doing these stories in Nehemiah. I think I will remember how much Nehemiah prayed before he did anything, he prayed. And I think he prayed during and after as well. And then he got on with it and did what needed to be done. He prayed and then he got on with it. I hope this week, if you've got jobs to do, you'll remember to pray and then get on with them the best you can. Thank you for listening. See you next week, hopefully, in Explorers. Bye. Thank you, Penny. And uh, don't forget, next week, if you can come along, um, our service will be live in the building as well as live streamed. Uh, David McNeish will lead it. It will have a communion as part of our worship. And I think Penny is coming back to do another children's spot next week. Now, Nehemiah, remember, remember, remember. Three times he said that word. And three times in that final chapter, he prayed. In fact, four times he prays mini prayers. So we're going to pray again now. And uh, we're going to remember, especially some of the folk who aren't here this week because of uh, they're having to self-isolate um, or whatever. So let's link our hearts together in prayer and pray for one another. Loving God, thank you that as a family we can commit our loved ones to you. We pray especially for the elderly of our church who uh, have been confined to their homes really for months upon months and uh, missing fellowship and friendship and companionship and we pray again lord that soon this uh, covid 19 the cures will be effective and we will be able to meet together again soon but in the meantime help them lord to draw close to you and discover you as a god of comfort and hope in this uh, awkward time so we pray for them we pray for those who are struggling with health we pray for sabrina this morning and give her wisdom as to what she should do next regarding her problems and we pray for your hand of healing to be upon her we pray for those who are moving we think of ed and joyce who will be moving away from us soon and we pray for them that all those uh, practical arrangements will work themselves out and that they will soon settle into their new accommodation we think of those who have loved ones in homes and able to to, to meet on a regular basis we pray for roger and jill this morning and ask, Lord, that somehow you will overcome the barriers so that they too can spend time together. Lord, there are so many in our fellowship we need to pray for. And we just pause and quietly 
or in our own homes, we commit other loved ones to you now. Lord, be pleased to hear and answer our prayers. We pray for the parents of our church, those who are seeking to raise young children. Give them patience, strength, and wisdom, we ask. We pray for their youngsters, that you'll help them to grow not just physically, but also spiritually, to come to faith in you, and that that faith will grow. We pray for those in the church who are single. Lord, we ask that you will, if it's your will, find them the right partner that person who can enrich and help and comfort and in- encourage them in life. And we pray for those who are uh, out of work at the moment, either furloughed or looking for a job. Lord, we pray you will provide for them and that you will find them the right uh, area of work so that they can serve you in that capacity. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. You know what our needs are. We ask that you will help us uh, emotionally, mentally and spiritually to be positive and to grow and develop. So hear our prayer. Receive our thanks as we bring all this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to have a song again, and it just reminds us we have a great God, a God who is not distant, a God who has been at work in our lives, and that is one of the reasons we should worship and serve him. So let's enjoy singing, Great is the Lord.
Or Nehemiah chapter 13, if you have a Bible, standing by our promises. Standing by our promises. Nehemiah chapter 13. There's a story told of a politician who was photographed for an article that was going to be published in a magazine. And when he received the proof of the photographs and had to choose one to to use, he was quite disappointed. So he phoned up the photographer and said, excuse me, uh, but these photographs do not do me justice. The photographer replied, sir, with a face like yours, you don't need justice, you need mercy. Now we are used today, aren't we, of uh, perfect pictures. We use that expression, it's been photoshopped, and we can remove the blemishes, uh, uh, the blemishes and the uh, faults and uh, the things we don't want in. One of the great things about the Bible is it is not photoshopped. It has all the faults and failings of the many individuals that we read about. And if you and I were writing Nehemiah, we would end at chapter 12. We'd end on a high. If it was a Hollywood movie, the credits would roll at the end of chapter 12. And really, chapter 13 is a bit of a spoiler because it shows that the people backslid. They went back on their promises. And it's kind of a a sad ending to a great story. So sorry, folks, there is no, and they all lived happily ever after in the book of Nehemiah. Now, we've seen some great moments, and, uh, but it also finishes, like I said, with disappointment. Now, to appreciate chapter 13, you need to realize that uh, at the events of verses 4 to 13, um, really come after Nehemiah has returned back to Susa, uh, Babylon, modern-day Persia, and then come back again. So there's a break, really, between verse 3 and verse 4 of this chapter. Nehemiah, for about 12 years, has been in Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the people. Then he goes back to Susa uh, in Persia. How long he's there for, we don't know. The people might not be able to keep their promise, but Nehemiah could. In chapter 2, verse 6, he promised the king, King Xerxes, that he would return when the job was done. And he kept his word. But obviously a second time he heard there was problems and the king granted permission. And so in verse 4 to 31 of chapter 13, Nehemiah returns to again rebuild not the wall, but the people. The wall is standing firm, but sadly the people have fallen down. Now there's a saying, isn't there? While the cat is away, the mice will play. While the cat is away, the mice will play. And that idiom, that phrase, simply means that without supervision, we tend just to relax, to take things easy, to bend the rules or even break the rules. After all, the boss isn't here. Nobody knows if I'm working hard or not. When the cat's away, the mice will play. Well, that was true of this nation. When Nehemiah went, all of a sudden, all those promises they made went out the window. And when he returns, verses 6 to 7 tells us what he finds is not good. It is heartbreaking. So deep disappointment is written throughout this chapter. Have you ever played the game Snakes and Ladders? I'm sure you have. Uh, It's that game where you roll the dice and if you end up on a square on the board with a ladder, you go up. You take a shortcut to success. But there's some big snakes And if you land on a snake head, you go all the way down and you could even end up back at square one. Sadly, that's the story of these people. They were heading for success, but then they went all the way back to square one. So it's an anticlimax to what is a great story, especially when you realize where this book is in history. Nehemiah and Malachi are probably the last two historical books of our Old Testament. So although Nehemiah is about the middle of your Bible, really it should, if it was chronologically written, be towards the end of your Old Testament. And scholars differ as to whether Malachi or Nehemiah is the oldest. There's about five years between the two. And you can find one expert that says the last historical book is Malachi and another who says it is Nehemiah. Now, we have grouped our Old Testament by categories, not chronologically. So they're not in the order they were written, 
but we have grouped them chronologically. We take the five books of the law and we start our Bible with the Torah. We take the 12 books of history, then the five books of poetry and the 17 books of prophecy. But Nehemiah is the last book of history. And what a disappointing way it finishes and what a disappointing uh, message. For 400 years, there will not be another book written. 400 years of silence to follow. 400 years to dwell on the failure of God's people. Now we're going to look at this section under a number of headings, but each one of my headings will follow three points. In each one of the sections, there is um, a problem, a response, and a short prayer. There is a problem, there is a response, and there is a short prayer. So that will be the outline of each of the three sections. The first section I'm going to call the submission promises. We're really going over chapter 10 again. But in this time, instead of the people making a promise and we spent time explaining what the promise meant, this time the people have broken that promise. So we won't go over the same old ground trying to explain it all. That's there in chapter 10 and on our sermon from chapter 10. But we will look at the promise they broke. And in verses 4 to 14, the problem is the submission promise. David Livingstone is one of my missionary heroes. Um, I used to think he was just an explorer until I read his uh, uh, biography. Incredible man who did an incredible work for God and uh, was a, a great man in uh, abolishing slavery across Africa. Incredible guy. Sadly, he's only remembered these days for the famous statement uh, that uh, Henry Morton Stanley made when he met him and said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. But late David Livingstone was a great man of God. He died from dysentery and malaria on the 1st of May in 1873. Now his heart was cut out of his body and buried under a tree in a small African village. Today there is a monument where the tree was. They then uh, embalmed his body and took it back to England. And if you're in London and you go to Westminster Abbey, you can find the body or the tombstone of David Livingstone. But here's the point. His heart is still in Africa with the people that he loved. Jesus said on one occasion, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Livingstone is a great example of that. Now, sadly for these people, their heart is no longer in Jerusalem. It's no longer in the things of God. It has been turned. It is finding new attractions and they have broken their promises. Their final statement in chapter 10, verse 39 was this. We will not neglect the house of God. Our heart is in the things of God. We'll not neglect them. And here in chapter 13, when Nehemiah returns, what is it they have neglected? The house of God. So that is the problem in this first section. When Nehemiah returns, it's deja vu. He refers, returns to Jerusalem and he has two of his arch enemies back on the scene. The baddies are Tobiah and Sanballat. And they have wormed their way back into the religious life of Jerusalem. And what is worse this time round is this. The high priest, Eliashib, who should have known better, has been influenced by them. Look at verse 7. The second part of verse 7 says, Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had, had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. Now the long and short of it is this, that cheeky Toby, if we can call him that, who was an Ammonite, he wasn't even a Jew, he was an Anamite, had got himself a penthouse suite in the temple. Now that room he is in should have been set apart for the things of God. It was to store the, the, the offerings and the grain for the Levites and for the worship of the temple. But instead it's hired out as a B&B &B to this man Tobias. He has defiled it by his presence there. So first of all, they have broken their submission promise. 
Now, with no tithes and no offerings in that room, verse 10 tells us the Levites couldn't live. They were starving. They had to return back to the fields and work the land. So the people had promised to look after God's house. They had promised to look after the ministers of God's house. And one by one, the dominoes fall. One by one, they break their promises. So that's the problem. What is Nehemiah's response? Well, it's there in three steps. Step one, verses seven to nine. He discovers what's happened. He storms through the temple and he does a bit of violent spring cleaning. He grabs hold of Toby, picks up his uh, bedding and his stereo and his suitcase and his wardrobe and his clothes and they're all thrown out. Verse seven says, I came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned the evil thing that Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put them back, in, back into them, the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. So his response is quick and decisive. So Toby is thrown out with all his belongings and the room is put back to its proper use. Now, did you think of any of a story when you hear that? My mind instantly went to Jesus, who went into a temple that should have been a house of prayer, but instead was a marketplace. People were selling animals and, and trading coins, and, uh, and uh, it was a, a money exchange. And Jesus got hold of the tables and turned them over. He made a whip of cords and drove out the animals and rebuked the people, just like Nehemiah does here in the Old Testament. And I guess the challenge for both of us is at times we can allow things into our temple, our lives that are not right. And they can even take the place of God. What do we need to drive out? So first of all, step one, Nehemiah kicks out Toby. Secondly, Nehemiah rebukes the officials and place them at their stations. And then step three, Nehemiah chooses four men in verse 13. I won't read their names because they're quite difficult. Verse 13, four men. He chooses a, a priest, a Levite, a, a, a layman, and a scribe, representing the people of Jerusalem. But he chose them, verse 13 says, because they were trustworthy. Trustworthy. That was the characteristic that qualified them to do that job. So Nehemiah kicks out or removes the problem, Tobias. Step two, he reappoints officials, four men in charge, to do the job. And then he finishes with a prayer. Each one of these sections, he has a mini prayer. Penny mentioned in the children's talk that Nehemiah often prayed and then worked. And here he works and then prays. And he says in verse 14, Remember me for this, my God. And do not blot out what, have I so, what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. So first of all, the submission promise broken, verses 4 to 14. Secondly, the Sabbath promise broken, verses 14 or 15 to 22. Now we've explained in previous talks what the Sabbath Shabbat is. We've talked about why Christians don't celebrate the Sabbath, but we celebrate the Lord's Day, Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the dead. But to remind us of how important the Sabbath was and still is to religious Jews, we're going to watch a short video. And uh, this is uh, produced by Jewish people to remind uh, Jewish people the importance of the Sabbath. So maybe you're Jewish and wondering how to get started doing this Shabbat thing. Or maybe you're not Jewish and you want to better appreciate what your friend is up to or why your coworker leaves early on Fridays. Let's look at two things. Why people do Shabbat and how. Okay, so why? It's the single most important building block of living a Jewish life, according to pretty much everyone. The Torah explains in chapter one that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day ceased from creating. So to mark that and appreciate creation, Jews cease creating things as well. We live life in the realm of space, going places, making things, buying and fixing stuff. 
We have to focus on the physical world on a day-to-day -day basis, and sure, we can do it mindfully. But Shabbat is a maneuver into the world of time. Letting go of making and buying and fixing is entering what Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel famously called a palace in time. It's hard to set aside the phone, the email, the cleaning, the errands, but that's the whole point, to set aside the time for something holy. It not only connects you to God, but also to yourself and the whole of the Jewish people. It creates a rhythm to life with the seventh note of rest time. Now, to the how. People talk about Shabbat being a day of not working or a day of rest. Jewish tradition actually defines 39 categories of creating-ish work, planting, building, hoisting stuff around that you're supposed to refrain from on Shabbat. And traditionally observant Jews extrapolate from that to mean no emails, no errands, no driving, cooking, or using technology. It's more than what's not done. Making Shabbat, or as you might hear it said, keeping Shabbos, means making sacred time. People bring in Shabbat by lighting candles at sundown and go from a dinner with challah and wine and singing to a morning maybe spent at services hearing about the Torah portion to a big lunch with friends or a picnic in the park. There are naps, and strolls around the neighborhood, books, text study, games, lots of low-key pastimes. It ends at nightfall on Saturday with a candle putting out ritual called Havdalah. There are tons of ways to celebrate Shabbat. And if you want to know more specifics about challah, candles, or songs, or how to say some of the blessings, we have plenty of resources for you. Heschel said that things do not... Time for God. Time for God. I know she spoke really fast, but did you catch that one line when she started? She said, Shabbat, the Sabbath, is the single most important building block of living a Jewish life. The single most important building block of living the Jewish life. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago, Christians disagree as to what the Sabbath is and what you can do on the Sabbath. I've yet to meet anyone who thinks the Sabbath's important as a Christian who keeps those 39 categories that she does. We celebrate the Lord's Day, but the principle is the same. Time for God. Time for God. The problem is one of the Jews showed their difference to the nations around them is they kept one day, time for God, called the Sabbath, a complete day of rest. Not only did the Jews not work as commanded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, not even their animals worked. They had a Sabbath day. They had a day of rest, according to Exodus 23, verse 12. It was a sacred time. But look at verse 14. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. Hey, when Nehemiah returns, that big distinction between his people and all the other nations has gone. All kinds of trading going on. Now, the trading wasn't the problem in the sense they could do it on all over six days. Trading was good. It was necessary. But the principle is one day for God, six days for work. And they broke that principle. They didn't prioritize their time with God. They allowed it to slip. They put riches before their God. Now, why do we prioritize our collective worship? Because we need to. We need to. And I use it carefully here. The Jews had 24 hours separated in the week for worship of God. You and I, well, we might have a couple of hours a week on a Sunday morning. Do we prioritize those two hours? Is it important to us? We meet collectively together to spend time collectively with God. You can worship God on your own, but the Bible says there is no place for a lone Christian. No place for the lone ranger. And even the lone ranger had tonto. We need each other. The Bible calls us a body, a family. We are collectively to meet together to worship God. And it should be a priority over so many other things 
that we tend to do and think, it's only church, I can miss it. Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, While Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't, it's a book written to businessmen, not a Christian book at all, writes these words. Good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government, principally because we have a good government. Few people attain great lives, in large part, because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. So he wrote that quotation in the realm of business. Don't just be good, be great. But you can apply the principle spiritually. Few people attain great lives for God because it's so easy to settle for a good life with God. Hey, if we want to be great men and women of God and to make a difference, we have to prioritize. And one of the things we prioritize is time for God in our personal lives and time for God collectively as his people. So the problem here is they let the Sabbath go. They break the promise. Nehemiah's response, step one, verse 15, he rebukes them. He likes to confrontation Nehemiah. Most of us don't like confrontation. But Nehemiah seems happy to look him in the eye and tell them they're doing wrong. Step two, verse 16 to 18, he rebukes the nobles because they allowed the trade to happen. They should have stood firm, but they didn't. And he reminds them in verse 18, the very reason they ended up in Babylon for 70 years as slaves, as captives, is because they neglected the Sabbath. They've gone all the way back, not just to, state, to square one on the snakes and ladders board, they're not even on the board. And then verse 3, he again takes practical action. Verse 19, he appoints his own men to make sure the city gates are closed. He can't trust the locals, so he has to bring in his own private security firm to get the job done. And then he, he, he realizes what the tradespeople are doing. They're all queuing up outside the city the night before on the Sabbath. It's a bit like people queue outside of Harrods for the sale so they can get in first the next day and get the best pitches. So he even makes sure they can't do that. Nehemiah sets his men on the walls and prevents them. And also illegal trading would have taken place. They could throw down baskets and bring up the goods and then send down the exchange, the money or whatever they were uh, uh, bartering for in those days. So Nehemiah puts all trading to a hold. And then verse 22, he finishes with a prayer. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. And then the third and the final promise they break is the separation promise. Verse 23 to 29, the separation promise. Because they broke their promise to submit to God's word, they no longer live separately to the nation's around them. In chapter 10 and verse 30, the people promised not to intermarry with the nations around them. And we explained why in a previous study. This was not racial, it was religious. If you go to Jerusalem today, um, three-fourths of the total population of Israel is Jewish. You will find Jews from Eastern Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, America, both North and Latin. A whole mixture of race. Races are not important, but their religion is. And that's what binds all those races together in Israel today. In the Old Testament, think of the story of Ruth. Evidence that God is not against non-Jews. She actually converts to Judaism and is part of the genealogy, the ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is this. If you married your sons and your daughters to foreign men and women, then they came into your home with their gods and their religion and corruption set in. Some of you have been self-isolating. Imagine if you've been self-isolating for five months and then on Monday morning, there's a knock on the door. And it's one of your cousins from a high-tier area. 
you've got a problem. Do you let them into your home? What if they bring contamination? They may be all right, but there again, you might get infected. You can't risk letting them into your home because you will get contaminated yourself. And if you apply that principle spiritually, if you allow people into your homes with their gods and religion, then corruption will take place. That was the problem here. Look at verse 27. Must we hear now that you are all doing this terrible wickedness and being unfaithful to our God, marrying foreign women? Nehemiah makes it clear it is about being unfaithful to God. That's what behind all these areas. So that's the problem. What's his response? Verse 25. Now dare I say every leader loves verse 25. The the living Bible paraphrases it this way. I confronted these parents and cursed them and punched a few of them and knocked them around and pulled out their hair and they vowed before God they would not let their children intermarry with non-Jews. So first step one, he confronts the people. Step two, he physically assaults them. And of course, it was tongue-in-cheek when I said every leader loves these verses. But sometimes you wish you'd get hold of people and shake them and say, don't you realize the stupidity of your actions? Come on, get your act together. But of course, if we did that today, there would be a lawsuit. So uh, we don't do that. Why did Nehemiah pull out somebody's beard or hair? Well, it was a cultural thing. It doesn't mean anything today in our society, but in his day it did. Isaiah in chapter 50 verse 6 pulls out a beard. Ezra chapter 9 verse 1 to 7, the same thing happens. And in 2 Samuel 10 verses 4 to 5, the cutting off a beard, the pulling off a beard meant humiliation. And Nehemiah is saying to these people, you should be ashamed of yourself. You have been unfaithful to God. And this was a physical way of showing it. Now, members of Duncan Road, we are not going to come round and pull out your beards. So ladies, relax. And gentlemen, we're not going to pull out the hair from your head. We're not going to assault you in any way. But this is a reminder that this was serious to God. So it should be serious to us. Step one, he confronts the people. Step two, he physically assaulted them. And step three, they promised not to intermarry with the other nations. And as all the other sections, he finishes with a prayer. In fact, two. Verse 29, he says, Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. And then in verse 31, verse B, Remember me with favor, O my God. And that's how Nehemiah chapter 13 finishes. And let me just conclude with a, and finally. If you think of those headings I used, how can we apply them to ourselves? First of all, the submission promise. It is never too late for a Christian to submit to God. It's never too late to start taking God's word seriously. It's never too late to say, right, from this day, I'm going to start praying. From this day, I'm going to start making sure I attend church on a Sunday. From this day, I'm going to tell other people about Jesus. From this day, I'm going to help practically serve other people. Hey, it's never too late to submit. And we can do that afresh starting this day. The Sabbath promise. Hey, it's never too late to make time for God in our private devotions, in our public expression of worship. Let's get our priorities sorted. Also in that Sabbath section, Nehemiah had to tell him off about their giving that had dried up. And again, some of us need to look at our finances and how we use them. And then finally, the separation promise. Hey, don't play around with sin. Don't get cozy with compromise. In our relationships, the Bible says, don't get attached or yoked to unbelievers. Remain distinct. Stay holy. Sauna said that the Christian is either a hammer or an anvil. You know, in the old blacksmith, he'd have a hammer and an anvil. Either you shape the metal or the metal shapes you. 
Are we those who shape society or are we those being shaped by society? Are we shaping the lives of those we come into contact with or are they shaping our lives? Let's be distinct. Let's stay holy. Let's pray. Lord, remember what we've learned from Nehemiah. Help us to remember it. Help us to apply it to our lives for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we conclude, there's an old hymn. That really is a prayer. Let's sing it and pray it together. Don't forget, uh, next week, hopefully we've got a uh, congregation live in the building. If you can come along, you're welcome. If you can book in beforehand, that will help. We'll also have communion as part of our worship next week. And Dave McNeish is our guest speaker and will lead the service. So look forward to next week. Um, don't forget our house groups. You can join our house groups. If you're not part of the team, send us an email, message us, and we'll see if we can link you up. And uh, we're going to conclude now with a short prayer of benediction. Uh, famous words from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and 